Hey, and welcome back. We're gonna jump right into states. Now, there are a bunch of different states that we need to think about when designing inputs. Different states tell the user what is currently happening and what should happen next. These states can be differentiated with like text, color, borders, and these visual cues are integral to a good input. So let's jump into the different types of states we encounter. So the first one we have right here is your default state. And this just shows an empty field that hasn't been interacted with. So, I mean, there's just an empty field, there's your label, there's nothing. I mean, it's just standard, it's default, and user hasn't even clicked into it yet or entered anything. Next is your active field. So the user is active, they are in focus right here. And what happens is, is the user has clicked into this. It has a highlighted border or your outline, you can call it, and a carrot over here on the left to show the user that they should be typing something. So mind you, this carrot's always flashing. So just to let the user know that an action needs to happen. Next is filled. So this is a filled input. So once a user has filled an input and entered all the information and clicked away from the field, it'll look similar to your default input, but the only difference is that there's text in there and it's been completed. So users know that they can move on. So really straightforward. Next is disabled. So sometimes you run into a case where an input should be disabled due to a requirement restriction. Disabled inputs are generally shown as filled in, grayed out, or to indicate that you can't interact with it. Sometimes they could have some information in there that can't be edited, but it is grayed out until some action is taken. And just keep that in mind that when we are designing forms and stuff like that, we should be designing for disabled inputs as well, because that scenario could happen. Success states. Okay, so when an answer is correct, you have the option to show a success message. So similar to the error input, we communicate that with color. We have green, we have icons, and appropriate text. So you don't necessarily need to show uh, correct or success messages all the time. It may make sense in certain scenarios. If your form is designed really well, users will often like have multiple success states like this, and that may get way too redundant. It may make sense in some scenarios, so keep that in mind. Now this one is really important. We have an error. When a user has entered something incorrect, or maybe the user may have missed an input, they should be shown an error message. Now the message generally should have the appropriate color, red. We have icons and text. This error should always, and I stress this, this should always be in line the form or in line to the input and not necessarily outside of the form. Underneath the actual corresponding input is totally fine. And that's where I think you should be putting all your error messages. The worst thing is when you have a like a four or five field form and then you have the error message all the way at the top of the form or at the bottom of the form. And you're like, well, well, what did I enter wrong or what went wrong? That is a pretty bad experience. So keep it confined to where the actual error is just so users can quickly remedy that. Now we kind of touched upon this in our lesson on typography in terms of like the appropriate text as well. So let's talk about assistance. Now, there will be times when a user comes to an input and needs a bit of assistance, uh, you know, a tip or a hint, this will help the user fill out your input much quicker. If you do it right, here are certain ways we can provide assistance to our users. So one way is hint text. Now we touched upon this a little bit. So I have hint text right here, right beside my label right aligned, not necessarily as a placeholder. I don't do placeholders often, but using hints above or below your input field gives users helpful information about the question you're asking them. So if you need to use it, ooh, that is incorrect actually. If you need to use it, use it like that on top or below, just to give users some helpful hints if they need it. This could be like a CVV number, I mean, Maybe not that, but you could use it for birth dates in terms of the format. 
I always know when I'm entering a date format that I don't know if I should put the date first or the month first or the year first. And, you know, I've been asked in all separate ways. It's just good to have some sort of outline on how to do that. The next is auto format. So we have an auto format credit card number over here. And essentially we have the power to automatically format a user's answer depending on the scenario. So this avoids any format errors and helps users read and review their answers. So think like things like credit card numbers, phone numbers, et cetera. So right now I have a credit card number here and it's just much more easier for me to break it up into chunks rather than to read it like this. So this is not as easy to read. I know it says one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but it's harder to read when it's all combined. So breaking it into chunks or auto formatting that is just a much easier experience on the user. So keep that in mind and have a good conversation with your developers about doing that. So we've seen this input before. Now autocomplete. Sometimes users need to enter something long or they may not necessarily know what they're trying to search for and we should help them with autocomplete. This saves the user a bunch of time and also reduces the possibility of errors with formatting and spelling. So if we have an address like we have down here, it's just much more easier to get them to start typing in the, the first letters or first numbers of their address and then start autofilling. It could be even used for like answering a question, a specific question in relation to something and the user doesn't necessarily know the answer or there may be multiple answers or they may be searching for multiple things. So autocomplete has a wide variety of use cases and you should use it when the user may be confused on what to enter or it could cut down on the amount of time a user could enter information like a long address, which is pretty pedantic when you think about it in terms of entering one. Now, default values. It's always smart to pre-fill text fields with the most likely answer when the answer is expected by the majority of your users. So if I were to ask you a question about like your country and I knew 95% of my users are in Canada or the United States or whatever country, I could pre-fill that data with just Canada or the United States. And that would be a much easier experience for the majority of our users so they don't have to go through the process of actually selecting that or finding that answer. Now in this case, potato chips, and the right answer is always salt and vinegar. So <laughs> that's my favorite, uh, my favorite flavor for uh, chips, but you should always think about how you can make the user's life a little bit more easier. And that's it for inputs.